Don't forget to follow us on social media for beautiful food and inspiration. Everybody, welcome to Down Ballot. We do this show most uh, Tuesdays, almost every Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. Support the project at uh, echoplexmedia.com. Just click the support tab, find your uh, favorite way. It does not matter to me so much anymore, though I do prefer that you just give me fucking money. Um, I'm Producer Dave. You can find me on Grinder. Greetings, Producer Dave. As always, this is the Councilman. You can find me at T-H-E underscore Councilman on the whole X thing, if you're still going there, if anyone's still going there. I don't even know if it's a thing. Um, you can also find me in the club. You can find me on a meal cart, and you can find me just about anywhere. So please hit me up. Slip into my DMs. I'd love to see you. i love to play with you. i love to have fun on the weekend at the beach. Cool. Uh, I almost never ask anybody this. Can you uh, back off the gain on your interface just a touch there? Oh, yeah. I think last week we had it turned up a little bit and I forgot to dial it back down. How's that? Much better. Much, much better. Excellent. Yeah, I don't know what was yeah, going I dialed on. It. Something weird happened oh. last week, but that weird thing no, went away. 
it was with the the bad baby was sleeping in the other room, so Daddy had to you know keep his his vocals down to a, a minimum, so ramped up the gain so I could be heard. So now now you're at you're at you're at you're at peak councilman, full councilman. Exactly. You're you're all going to get the peak of me today. Although um, it's the peak minus all the energy that's expended in in child rearing. It's a thing, folks. It really is a thing. <laughs> Do not expect your life to ever be the same. Not that I did. We knew what we were getting into. So, <laughs> speaking of getting into it, oh my god, fucking meat spill. You want to just let it go? Let's let it rip. Meat spill. Yeah, I mean, this it says it all. It's down ballot. Tonight, with a traffic nightmare caused by this, you see right here, a meaty mess in the East Bay. Cars were burned for miles because of a truck that spilled meat along 880 in Oakland. Tonight, that mess is gone, but the truck it came from still hasn't been found. Here's a picture. <laughs> now at the cleanup uh. using trucks with shovels on them to move that mess off the freeway northbound lanes were closed for about three hours nbc bay area's pete serratos joins us from near the oakland coliseum the lanes are all clear now along 880 north in oakland but getting to the zach bryan concert here at the oakland coliseum took a little <laughs> bit longer than expected as a result of that meat spill on the freeway now here's video <laughs> from earlier this evening. Uh, now, according to CHP, uh, they said that a truck spilled chicken parts along 880 <laughs> North just before 5 p.m. That truck apparently continued along the freeway. I mean, what do you do, stick around? <laughs> Try to clean it up? It was called to clean up the mess, which led to traffic being diverted to High Street. So that's when you had miles upon miles of backup traffic this evening. Now, the good news is that crews were able to clean up the freeway so those lanes are reopened. But for concert goers that we spoke to, the drive into the Coliseum wasn't exactly ideal. And that was really upsetting because I just want to be at the concert. And I'm just like, why am I sitting in traffic? I want to be here. I want to see the openers. But it's hard when we're stuck in traffic. It just makes me feel upset. You can see the ETA on Google Maps and it says like 7, 7 o'clock. And then by the time we're driving, it's like 8.15. I'm like, what? what's going on out there? And by the time we over here, it's just like gridlock, nothing moving. And when you do go in there, it's just as bad. Now, CHP says there were four separate crashes as a result of that meat spill, but there were oh, no major injuries. Now, they did point out they are still looking for the oh. truck that was involved in this meat spill. Uh, if you were on the freeway at the time, they're encouraging anyone to come forward with any information. No, don't rat this guy out. To see or the gal. In Oakland. Pete Serratos, NBC Barry and you. Do not rat this person out. They're already having a bad enough day, let me tell you. <laughs> Seriously, uh, if they dump their whole payload, right? Like, you know, Jabba the Hutt, don't don't play with that. So um, they're going to be in trouble with their, their supervisor <laughs> when they get where they're going already. And they're trying their best probably just to keep this under the wraps and, uh, you know, not make any uh, more of a meaty situation out of this than already <laughs> has been made. Um, but that's just fucking disgusting. And it's perfect for leading off our, our first true docket in a couple of weeks here on Down Ballot. That was the most down ballot story of the year, I think. Oh, it's just in, like, I'm just thinking, you know, God, I, I'm the guy that thinks, like, there's, like, going to be little particulates of meat and chicken fat and bone, like, ground into that freeway forever. Because <laughs> they're never going to get it all out, no matter how much they spritz it. <laughs> Man, well, what it that's I gross. mean, like, it's been kind of warm. It's been warming up a little bit lately, too. Oh, what do you right? think? Oh, no, the poor person oh. driving that fucking, that view, the view, like the, the, the plow, basically. We'll call it the meat plow. The meat plow. And then, like, to be stuck in Luke Bryan traffic, like, on the other side of the freeway, on the other side of the median, right? And you're just, like, not moving and you're watching all this go down. And this, this stink is just probably overwhelming. Like, <laughs> you get the AC cranked up. Oh, man just brutal man these people are oh, these well. people be wishing for the smell of somebody shitting in front of the fucking cupcake <laughs> shop <laughs> or someone shitting in their like uh tailgating spot up at the up at the show anyway well uh hopefully you know uh we find well i'm, I'm sorry hopefully that the the person responsible for this uh does not you know lose their job and you know gets to live another to fight another day because we all know that you know meat spills happen it it's just just a way of life. It's out and of like, our hands. and like, uh, no snitching extra applies here because I'm just telling you, whoever was driving that truck had was having a bad enough day. For sure. I mean, like, what happened already with the truck to spill that kind of spill the beef like that? You know, like, I don't, I don't want to know. Honestly, 
Um, and no one's saying like, you know, no one seems to be, everyone seems to be assuming that the truck driver was responsible, right? But who knows? Maybe they got sideswiped. Maybe something happened, you know, uh, to cause this spill. It could might not have been driver error or mechanical malfunction, right? Um, it'd be curious to see that they, if they I, I can't imagine they're not going to find out at least the company responsible, if not the driver at some point. People are people, are people and there's just too many cameras and and like sometimes meat shopper. happens like it's not it right. doesn't necessarily have right. to be anybody's fault mm. uh, happy pride not month everybody seriously um but yeah if you're i i really tr i truly apologize if you're watching on twitch and you're like a, a vegan or something like that's got to be brutal to watch that so it's gross enough for maybe me maybe it was I'd a eat, militant eat. vegan that sideswiped the truck to it could have now that it, <laughs> wow now that we're thinking about it because um yeah it's it's hard enough for me to watch it so i can't imagine how you feel if you're you're not inclined to be eating the meats in the first place anyway let's um, move on well, to winners and losers where there are no yes. winners unless you were rooting for somebody and then they probably lose we're going to open up here with one of my least favorite people in the world thank you for putting this on here you're welcome uh, david Sachs is my least favorite venture capitalist which yeah that's david that's, a, that's pretty high praise or pretty low <laughs> praise i guess is this <laughs> anyway i guess um he's throwing a fundraiser for the former president um and tickets are expensive they're uh, venture he's... capitalist uh priced wait david Sachs is throwing a fundraiser for obama no 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 oh the other former president right, right okay right. well right. one of the other ones yeah one of the other living former presidents in the bay area for our campaign fundraiser on thursday which will be exactly one week since his conviction in his criminal election interference case hooray the sorry. That is now sorry circulating online knee jerk reaction that june 6th fundraiser will be hosted by tech billionaire david Sachs. tickets for the dinner three hundred thousand dollars per person Ooh. however that invitation does not say where the event will be held <laughs> surprise <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, David Sachs is going to dox himself. That'd be really good. That's it's going to be like a, um like a, remember back in the day when you'd have to go to like a map point to find out where the rave was. Yeah. Oh, for, for sure. Or do some sort of scavenger hunt, right? Um. No, I mean this is just a typical address on RSVP. I mean if you're if you're dropping three hundred G's to come to this event, like I'm pretty sure they can send you a quick email to let you know where the the shit's going to be. <laughs> um. And trust that you don't pass that along because you know you're spending three hundred G's. You, you're not going to share it with someone who's not spending three hundred G's to get into the event, right? Yeah, if I had to guess, it's going to be on the peninsula somewhere, possibly like Menlo Park or something like that. Well, where does David Sachs? I'm sure David Sachs has at least one residence, right, in the in that region. Um, so I'm sure at his house, probably. I, I more than more than likely next door to Steph Curry and Chris Kelly and all the other folks, <laughs> all the other Ather Athertonites. All right. Huh. Well. Right. <clears throat> Looks like uh, Mexico has elected their first female president. Um, there was, this was um, some other shit going on with this election. They'll probably mention it in this uh, in this news hit. Yeah, this is a quick hit to just let you know what happened, and then we're going to have another hit about uh, the local angle uh, with uh, Mexican uh, citizens voting here in the states. Been for Mexico's presidential race, and the numbers show former Mexico City Mayor Claudia Sheinbaum is projected to win that race. Ballots are still being counted, but according to official preliminary results, she is leading by a landslide. This marks a historic victory, with Sheinbaum set to become Mexico's first female president. She has pledged to continue the populist policies of Mexico's current president and her mentor, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. Hell yeah. Oh yeah, very nice, right? And we're on notice now again, and here, here in the lovely, forward-thinking America, uh, United States of America. Um, so anyway, uh, th that that's the result of the election. Um, so good news for progressives and people hoping for a more socialist agenda from the Mexican uh, leadership or a continuation of the current uh, agenda. And then uh, locally and in the states, uh, Mexican citizens obviously were allowed to to vote uh, in some cases for the first time. Um, and, uh, there were some challenges with getting, making that happen. So we're going to find out more from NBC Bay area. First hundreds of people waiting in lines at the Mexican consulate in San Jose. They want to cast ballots in the historic Mexico presidential election. Yeah, the polls closed an hour ago, and as NBC Bay Area's Marianne Favreau reports, tensions ran high as hundreds who wanted to vote were turned away. Marianne. 
Right at five o'clock, the doors to the consulate closed and no one else was allowed to vote. And hundreds of people were very mad because some of them had waited more than nine hours to cast their ballots. When the doors to the voting center closed, tensions increased with people chanting and pounding on the door. More than 300 people who wanted to vote were turned away. The line had wrapped around the building with hundreds standing under umbrellas to get relief from the heat. We talked with one woman who had been in line since 7.30 this morning and she did not get to vote. I feel so sad because we're waiting for this day and I can make it because it's a very bad organization. We don't have bathroom, we don't have water, we have a lot of people can in the last minute. And for the registration, I can be in uh, registration in line because it's a lot of trouble. This is considered a historic election because Mexico has never had a woman president and the two front runners are both women. But it's also the first time that Mexican nationals can cast a ballot at the consulate in person. A National Institute for Elections spokesman admitted that they did not expect such a huge turnout today. But he says voters have had the opportunity to vote online or by mail for months. 423 people were registered to vote here in San Jose today, and there were at least 600 people who were not registered but had a voting card and were able to vote here today. Now, adding to all of these frustrations, the air conditioning and the elevator to the voting center broke. Now, we also no. saw that several San Jose police officers arrived here after 5 o'clock. We saw them go into the building, and they just left the building a few minutes ago. But tensions were so high here. Again, hundreds of people who had waited in line, some as long as nine hours, were not able to cast their ballots. And they felt very strongly about being able to cast their ballots in person because they felt like that was a more trustworthy process. Reporting live in San Jose, Marianne Favreau, NBC Bay Area News. Very clear this matters to so many. Marianne, thank you. It was a similar scene in San Francisco where voters face issues casting their ballots there. Video shows a line stretching down the street near the Mexican consulate. The first preliminary results are expected in about an hour. For the latest on this election, where, when we're not on air, you can just go to our website, NBCBayArea.com. So a couple things. One, they can vote online. I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I don't know how that works precisely. If it's, um, I'm guessing it's... I, I, I'm not going to guess, but I, it, it more than likely is some sort of form that they have to fill out and then return and has some sort of pin number attached to it. Or um, I don't imagine it's an online form, but it could be. Um, so I don't know. I mean, like form. if you can, if, I mean, you can do some pretty significant bank transactions on the internet. I don't know why you shouldn't be able to vote on the internet. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I don't, I agree. I just, uh, it's just that it seems like it's one of those things that the, the bridge hasn't been crossed and no one wants to cross it with voting at least i don't know why voting seems to be more sacred than per someone's personal finances um but yeah it, it's just the way it the way it seems to be for uh, people are seem to be the most reluctant to um let let it go to technology even open source technology um uh through you know in their elections it's it's very strange um i actually noticed that not to get too far afield, but uh, from the topic at hand, but in doing, you know, voter outreach, it's interesting. Um, folks, you know, you knock on their door, you ring their phone or their cell phone, and sometimes text them even. They don't, you know, if you talk to them, if you, if they come to the door, if they respond, they're generally congenial. They're not, Trump, you know, they're really not confrontational. They're not mad that you got their information. They don't ask, you know, how did you get my information? Um, they seem to accept it as part of just the way that um, we have to play the game of, of elections. Um, but when you email them, when you send a mass email to the voter, to voters, right, um, they suddenly become, and this is just from emails that they've provided themselves to the Secretary of State or to the Registrar, they, they, it's, it's weird when you invade that space, they suddenly become very upset. And how did you get my information? And you know, because uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because they feel like suddenly now they're on a list somewhere because they're <clears> getting emails. <throat> but uh, it, it's very, it's it's interesting the way people think about uh, about that. But uh, anyway, 300, 400 people who come to, you know, the place to vote on election day should be allowed to vote. doesn't matter if it's 
too late or, or close at 5 p.m. or whatever. With our elections, if you're there in line when the polls close, you're allowed to vote. However long it takes to process everybody, you just do it. So they obviously weren't prepared, um, but that's no excuse. I mean, it was the you know, first time. It's the first time. Yeah. First time, and, but uh, no excuse, you know, figure out a way to at least let them vote now or let them get their, we had to vote, have a vote that counts in some way, right? Look, it sounds like it was, at least for president, there was an overwhelming, you know, landslide. Um, I don't know what that means, but uh, so more than likely their votes are going to impact the election, but at least they can have their vote heard, right? That's the whole point um, of them showing up. So uh, yeah, anytime someone's in line to vote and stands in line to vote, even for a minute, you know, at, at, if they're there before the polls close, they should get a chance to vote. So <clears throat> I also want to bring up that we're going to see some, uh, I'm, I'm predicting, I think this is a, a gimme, that there's going to be some misinformation and disinformation <clears throat> during our November election with imagery of this, with people, Mexican nationals showing up at the Mexican consulate to vote. Uh, then people are going to be claiming that those people, that that's from November and that those people are voting in our election here, uh, here this November. Right. Those, uh, look at this, you know, a uh, wash of I illegals who are trying to you know, rush into our elections and swing, swing our elections and steal it from Donald Trump, the rightful felon owner. Right, right. I mean, it's, uh, it, I mean, I feel almost stupid even saying that. Not that it's like, not that it's a dumb prediction. It's a correct prediction, but it's, it's almost so obvious that it should go without saying. That's, it's very true. It's, it's sad because of that. It's sad because it should go without saying, right? That's actually very emotionally sad. Um, but at the, in the, in the greater context of everything else, Donald Trump, it's like, ah. so, um, this next story is a little bit weird to me because mm. I mean, maybe so it, Viva Calle is going to be on the east side this time. For people who don't know what Viva Calle is, they shut down some streets and let people cycle and walk around and drink on the street and kind of party in San Jose. I've had a good time uh, in showing up, uh, but also involved with like bike party when they have a booth. I, you know, I'll sit at the booth for a while. I'll DJ a little bit and stuff. You know, it's it's fun. Um, and usually, it seems like the local businesses do things to try to draw people in, right? They'll, they'll put some, you know, maybe some of their merchandise outside with somebody, you know, if it's like a boutique or something, they'll put like merchandise outside sure. and, you know, maybe the, maybe the owner themselves will be out there. Or if they're a restaurant, they'll be doing, you know, street food that's similar to what's in their restaurant, but they'll be doing it out outside using, you know, outside cooking stuff. And it's always seemed like the local businesses have been pretty happy to be involved. So I'm like really curious what uh, what this what they're going to say in this story because it seems like the this Viva Calle that's happening over on the east side has a different response, or there's just a few people who are not happy about it, and the news is picking up on those people. We'll we'll have to we'll have to take a look and see which it is here. I think it's probably a bit of both, but we'll see. It is one of San Jose's marquee events. It's called Viva Calle, and it's part of the festivities. The city shuts down streets so people can bike or walk from Albaden Valley all the way to the east side. Tonight, though, many small businesses along that route say it's anything but a celebration for them. In fact, they say it's hurting their bottom line. NBC Barrier's Damien Trujillo joins us along that route. Some of the merchants here along Alam Rock Avenue say they've been taking it on the chin. And when the event happens, a couple of them say they'll have to close. It's always a party at Mariscos Costa Alegre on Alam Rock Avenue. But on June 9th, when hmm. the city closes down his street to host the next Viva Calle Festival, the owner says the city's celebration is a nightmare for business. Sunday is the, the day that we make profit, you know, Saturday, Sunday. Marco Hernandez says winter sales were bad, and with the struggling economy, he can't afford to lose his biggest sales day of the week. We heard similar stories at several stores along Alam Rock Avenue. We're a small business. One day affects, especially on the weekdays, it gets really slow. On the weekends is when we do the sales. If they're closed, the streets, we have no access for my customers to come in. What can I do? I need pay bills, I need pay the people help me. Maria de la Torre says her bakery is going to have to close that day. Viva Calle draws thousands uh, uh, of people to the outdoors and perhaps not Mexico bike bakery. Or walk through parts of the city they've never been. But the merchants wonder if that discovery comes at too high a cost. It's my job to elevate their concerns and work with the city to make sure that as we do these 
events that the community appreciates that we don't leave behind our immigrant merchants. Councilman Peter Ortiz says the city needs to find ways to make the small businesses a bigger part of the festivities. The owner of the Western store says he's seen no promotional benefit each time the city closes his street. No residual sales. They can go to Allen Rock Park to walk. They can go to a park. I mean, they don't have to shut down the streets. Honestly, I mean, it's, it's really upsetting. Damien Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. So a couple things here. I could see like yes. the Western shop and maybe the wedding shop not doing so well during Viva Calle. But the fuck, the fuck are the, what the fuck is the bakery and the restaurant talking about? Yeah, I don't understand what Mexico bakery would be doing closing down on Viva Calle. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. They'd have so much traffic and their stuff is so delicious. Don't, don't rob people of those tortas and all right, those beautiful you do, conchas. Like, you do, you do, a, you do, you just do this thing where you hang out out front with little pieces of cut up, whatever your, yeah. your goodies Pan are. Dulce, people grab yeah. them. People grab that. Yeah. That's good. You go, you know, you could buy three of those if you want. Exactly. We got it. And we got a Viva Calle deal today. You can get three for five, right? Like it's what in the world are you thinking? Right. Um, and really you're, a, if you're a, if you're selling like Western, like accoutrement, right. Boots and whatnot, you're kind of a destination place already. People are going to figure out how to get to your place. And by the way, it's not the whole day. It is a portion of the day. They don't even let, you know, let it go on nine to five. There's plenty of time. Like if you wanted to, you know, put it out there to your fan base <laughs> that you're going to be open uh, early and late that day, but not during the event. Sure. But it's also not about like, you know, I, I, is there some regular clientele that comes to you for that on a Sunday? Like, aren't you interested in growing your business and, and reaching out to new customers and saying, Hey, you who doesn't know about me, like, wouldn't you like to get your boots here? Maybe you need some Western boots. I got Western boots, yo, come check them out. Right. Uh, and they're walking and biking around and there's hell of people out just sort of exploring the city for the first time. All the, the güeros and the, the gringos from the West side are coming over to your community, right? Maybe they like Western boots, bro. Maybe that's a whole new market that you haven't even tapped into and you're like oh no 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 they're closing the streets go go walk in a park oh give me a break <laughs> like so, someone is someone is misinforming these folks about like the goals and what's what actually happens at these events they've, they've been shit on no no doubt these businesses have been shit on for many many years by a lot of by the city in, in a lot of different ways but viva Calle is not them the city shitting on these people not for nothing like the streets shut down that doesn't mean that all the streets around the street or shut down. Correct. And it's fucking hard to be honest with you. It's hard enough to get to Mexico bakery in a car now, <laughs> unless you're like traveling, you have to be like going over the overpass on one one in that lane and then turn into their driveway. Like you can't make any U-turns or, cr or cut across the aisle, you know, the middle Island. Now it's a mess. I just, I just want my torta, man. That's all I want. <laughs> and sometimes like, I'm going West. So the, the, the wedding shop, it's probably all appointments anyway, right? Like they probably oh, do business yeah. by appointment. So they could oh, say, yeah. they could they contact the out. people who have an appointment and just say, Hey, it's going to be a little harder to access, but here are where, here's the places we recommend that you park or we'll stay open late on Saturday. If you want to change your appointment to Saturday. And like, they could even have like a little, I mean, honestly, they have a little spot out front of their shop um, under a tent with maybe some misters or something, right? Where they're like doing fittings. So people walking by can see like some gorgeous, you know, beautiful bride getting all decked out in her potential, you know, dress. And they're, ooh, these guys do, these guys do dresses. Oh, my cousin or my, you know, nephew or my niece is getting married and, you know, they're, they're going to need some, uh, some bridal and some, some wedding gear, right? Right. Um, do you have a, do you have a card? Oh yeah, we have fucking shit tons of cards. Here's a deal for Viva Calle, 50% off, you know? It's like, what? In the, <laughs> that's the, that you're exactly right. That's the response. That's a business person's response. The response we're seeing here is from people who just are, are frankly, just not interested in running a successful business if so, you're not willing to take advantage of these opportunities. Again, I can see the wedding spot and the, the even like the, the Western spot, but the, the mm -hmm. fucking taqueria, I was like, I thought the taqueria was going to be like, all these drunk gringos are going to come in here and act a fool and be rude right? to my fucking staff. I'd have been like, okay, you have a point. Right. Like, Take advantage of me. Take advantage of me. Like I will eat. I'm, I am that gringo. I will eat your tacos. I will eat your food <laughs> and like put it in front of me, man. Especially samples. That bakery I, I too. That's something you can say. just grab the bakery. You can just grab and go. Yeah, for That's, sure. Dude. And magical bakery has all the shit you want. Like you want any kind of pastry. They've got it. Trust me. Like it'll, it'll, 
you know placate your whatever de- desire you have so definitely they should be they should stay open they should put up hand out samples they should be tossing pundles say from the, the rafters just to uh, you know and let more like, people know about their business like the, the if the bakery is real good even if somebody just grabs a sample and doesn't go in and they, if that shit's that good they might remember it next time they're in the neighborhood they might pop through and i'm sorry yeah. that ta- that taqueria is going to be if if they're open they're going to be cracking East Coast is going to be, yeah, they're, I mean, they're already pretty popular anyway, so I, yeah, I, we'll see. Um, but as long as they stay open, I, I do, I do, and I do hope this is just some folks just being misinformed about what the goals and the, you know, the concept of the event is, um, or how many people actually show up. And they've had these on Alum Rock before, I feel. I don't think this, I don't believe this is the first Eva Kaya that's gone down Alum Rock, so they can't be unfamiliar with this, this event. So anyway, I, I think they'll be pleasantly surprised. I, <clears throat> like the, the, the flip side of this by the way is like when campbell street shut down one of my friends runs like a fine dining establishment <coughs> which is mm-hmm. not what's gonna work right but you know, what he, you know what he does you know he does casual just dining shuts down the kitchen leaves the bar open there you go Ca- yeah casual just take advantage of the opportunity right cater to the audience know the room nope read then- the room then like the you know the street party ends at five he starts taking reservations at six so he fucking closes mm-hmm. his restaurant to get all the drunk people out would usually let me and brandon stay even though we were the drunk people <laughs> like there's you know what <laughs> the i mean irony like, it's it's or like the the behind that was an exotic car dealership you know what the guy did he hired us to dj inside of his car dealership and just told people to, when they came in he's like hey you know I don't, i'm not trying to sell you a car today just be a little bit careful be a little bit careful. Some of these cars are expensive. And people would like dance. And it was like, he was like, fucking get the fuck out of here. Like, right. Like the, the, the fucking, the Celtic shop had like racks out in front. And the lady was just saying hi to everybody as they walked by. Nobody was buying Celtic shit at the fucking, at the fucking boogie on the bayou. Yeah. No, but at least you're, you're, you're just meeting a new audience, right? You're meeting the people you're putting the, you're putting the flag out there. You're putting the shingle out in the mall. Cause if no one knows that you exist, right? It's the thing you can, you know, you can keep the doors open and you can have your regular clientele, your norms and your cliffs and all those people. Right. But if you don't have the new people or the randos or the people that come in just one time only, they're never going to come back to your establishment. Even, um, I, you're not going to sustain your business. I, I don't believe um, from my experience. So, so I mean, I could, I could go on and on about this. I mean, yeah. there was a, we went to a street party in Walnut Creek and this coffee shop we went to was so good that we used to, when I it was, it was a long time ago when I lived in Fremont before once a month, we'd drive up to Walnut Creek to go fucking kick it at the coffee to shop. Go there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we'd for go sure. shopping and you know, we'd do other stuff while we were out there or maybe pop by Oakland on our way. Or if we were going to a party in Oakland, maybe we'd go hang out at this coffee shop for a few hours in Walnut Creek and then, then pop over to Oakland or whatever. Like, like and that, spend yeah. some bucks, both places. Yeah. But yeah. I, the, the other one I do understand is the wedding shop. But I think, like I said, it's almost all by appointment. And they can re- they really can work around that. And it really, it's like one Sunday the whole year. There are 52 Sundays in the year, right? And you can't figure out how to get around or how to work around this one You notice time, how right? like the fucking tax guy who might be open Sunday isn't complaining? <laughs> the right. tax and it's not or... Yeah, and I guarantee you also that it's not as though they're just they just pulled this and they put up they put up the city put up flyers right and the business owner walked down the street saw the flyer like oh shit they're closing down the streets no they did the outreach they reached out to the business owners and said hey you know this is what's happening we're we're giving you a couple months notice this is going to happen on this date this is what's going to what it's going to mean what times we're going to close the streets this is who's going to be able to access the streets we're really excited about it here's some opportunities you have to partner with us right and like i'm sure <laughs> I'm sure that outreach happened. In a lot of these cases, it might, it might, it could just be the rank and file employees who are, you know, going on camera for whatever reason and not, you know, not the the business owners. Um, So it could just be a bunch of, you know, um, gobbledygook and conjecture um, from people who don't know any better because the business owners would be the ones that would get all the information. I just want to see the the follow up from the bakery. Mm -hmm. I just want to see like after Viva Calle, the the bakery person just throwing twenties in the air, you know? (laughs) Right. Right. Um, anyway, uh, it's disappointing to me. I was going to be heading out to this Viva Calle and I love Mexico bakery already. I'm already a patron of theirs. So, um, if they're closed, that sucks. I would totally stop by and grab a sandwich. If they're open, you should, if you should pop by and buy something and be like, I'm glad you're open. You know, I came down here and I wanted to, yeah, wanted to make sure, wanted to make sure to pop by here because the food's so good. 
Yeah, the first like, time like, I ever you got tried any flyers, it. any business cards I can give to give to friends? Yeah, exactly. The first time I ever tried it was good. So a, a friend brought one of their tortas to you know to eat at a, an event, and it was in, insane large, and he couldn't finish it, and he had, he offered me the other half, and that was it. It was a love affair from from day one. So I've I've been a fan of theirs. So that's how it happens. You just you make connections like that. So this is a great opportunity to do that. I hope they take advantage. Again, like like people in chat were saying too, even businesses that don't maybe have something they can sell to you during the event can do mm-hmm. other kinds of outreach, make yeah. I mean, make friends, or yeah. or you know, shut, maybe if you do have to close, go. Hey, I'm closed, but my friend next door's taqueria is fantastic. Right, right, right. Part partner up the uh, the wedding store and the 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 western store and the taqueria. I think could figure out a way to to make all this mesh. Maybe the taqueria does catering. Who knows. Um, and then it's like a Western style wedding, right? I mean, like, there's, there's, I mean, there's, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to have, we're going to have to move on, but this seems really stupid. The only one that I, I thought the Western store, I thought, I thought for sure, I was like, what are you talking about? Nobody goes to your Western store. Like somebody might be drunk as shit and on a fucking whim buy a $300 pair of boots from you. Right. Well, it gets, it gets some guys wearing $300 pairs of boots and riding bikes. And just circling around the street in front of your store and just showing do off how fancy they're... Do get, get, get fucking, do fucking square dancing in front of your store, you oh, idiot. Yeah, totally. That would be fabulous. Like, get I, the I, community involved and be like, do you want to learn to square dance? Like The widows, like me, again, like me. Like, ooh, yes, I would love to learn to square dance like a vaquero. Right, right. You, <laughs> you know, you don't, maybe don't, maybe don't, don't be such a dick about it like you were being, but sure, like... Can you show me your vaquero style? Right, but I mean, yeah, like I, I like I can't I can't imagine the, anybody getting mad if he's like, oh, would it be okay if I did, you know, n- not super big speakers, but if we were going to do a little bit of square dancing during the afternoon yeah. out here, like because I oh, would, for sure. I'd go square dance. Oh, for sure, absolutely, that'd be fun as hell. I'll go square dance with you, producer Dave. Anyway, Between we got to move on. Uh, the, the 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 unfortunately, the thumbnail for this is you're like, Ooh, like nighttime music in San Rafael. No, no, not the kind of fun story you might think it is. Apparently a business is using, um, music at night to try to uh, get homeless folks, uh, to go somewhere else. Let's see what the local news has to say about this. Is a North Bay business targeting a homeless encampment. People in that encampment say the tire shop next door is blaring music. Tomorrow, attorneys for the encampment will seek a restraining order against any more nighttime noise. Here's NBC's Terry McSweeney in San Rafael. It's been on for the last four days. Anchor Ardalan lives at the homeless encampment right next door to East Bay Tire on Lincoln Avenue near 2nd Street. He says, yeah, the music itself is nice in some circumstances, but not when it's put on a loop and it's blaring all night, as it has for the past four nights. They're saying they can't sleep, and, um, you know, it's it's just a little alarming considering that nobody knew about it. We asked the folks at East Bay Tire for a statement. They said no comment. But what is curious is that East Bay Tire has been here at this location for many decades, and the folks have been here at this homeless encampment just across that fence for many months. I asked the president of the Marin Homeless Union exactly what it is that caused the escalation. I think right now the property owner is trying to facilitate, is is being emboldened by the city of San Rafael's uh, antagonism towards camp integrity and uh, trying to help facilitate the city's mission of uh, forcing everybody out. In fact, Paulson says San Rafael is trying to dissolve the preliminary injunction that protects this camp from being disbanded. Efforts to contact the city of San Rafael for comment were unsuccessful. Tomorrow morning, attorneys for this encampment will be in Marin County Superior Court trying to get a restraining order to stop the noise. In San Rafael, Terry McSweeney, oh. NBC Bay Area News. Yeah, it's a, oh, it's a common tactic, um, but it, it's like, the old the version of the tactic that i knew about was like you know like when the kids would hang out at like a, a quick stop or like a like a like a liquor store and they'd play just music that the kids didn't like to try to get them going out somewhere else they'd probably play right. the same fucking boring ass classical music yeah it, and honestly it's, it's probably beautiful music um it's it's also just the, the poorest as you would appreciate the poorest delivery system possible right so it sounds like shit no matter what it is it could be chopin but it's uh, it just sounds like ass because it's coming from a horrible projection system. Um, yeah, this is absolutely designed to deter and to, 
you know, uh, make try to make these folks move on or, or go somewhere else. I don't know. Um, and the fact that it's been there, the encampment's been there for many months, doesn't mean that the business owners just finally didn't tire of whatever they they tire of, and uh, literally East Bay tires, right? Um, no pun intended. And uh, yeah, they decided to try to make these folks move on by any means necessary, whether that's Beethoven or Bach or Brahms or, you know. Um, it would have been great if one of the people Beyonce. would have said, you could have at least gotten better speakers, my God. Yes, right? <laughs> or plastic. <laughs> Someone's really going to have to do a show about how good this music sounds. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, Shame on you, business owners. This is sim- this is similar to a story we had about uh, business owners along a certain strip of uh, Fremont who who had put out you know the big boulders near Mission Boulevard, right uh, along the, the median to prevent RVs from parking on the median. Right. Um, yeah, sim- similar stuff. Where they, I mean, they didn't have a permit to do that; they just did it, and no one told them not to. And that's really the problem. Is the I don't know how much recompense these folks are going to get. It's good that they have attorneys. I, that's pretty impressive that the encampment can have their own attorney. <laughs> so it's pretty, probably pro pretty bono step. work from uh, some charity. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, one hundred percent it is. But it's just that that's that's great. That's fantastic that they have that because even then, even finding someone to do pro bono work for you is difficult and challenging if you don't know people, right? Um, so and if you don't have the opportunity to, to reach out to them or know where to find them, so that's that's great. That's fantastic that they have representation. Hopefully that means they get some recompense and uh, we will keep following it here in a uh, down ballot as we always do. We always come back to these stories. If there is a follow up, I promise. So um, up next, apparently uh, a <coughs> uh, 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 <laughs> customer of the, that fucking shop that we were uh, talking about earlier uh, mm. got, got fucked with by the police in Richmond. Let's see. Uh, let's see what apparently. happened. A professional says Richmond police violently arrested him as he recorded the end of a car chase. This incident happened earlier this month, and now the man known as Cowboy Crazy is taking legal action. ABC 7 News reporter Melanie Woodrow is in the newsroom with the story. Melanie. Dan, Richmond police had stopped a vehicle they say had been involved in a shooting outside of Joe's Market on McDonald Avenue, May 5th, around 10 p.m. As they were taking people out of that vehicle into custody, Quasi Gus started videotaping. His attorney says he was exercising his rights to film the police. Richmond police say he was obstructing a police officer. In this video of a police stop May 5th, Richmond Police Sergeant Alexander Kane turns his attention to Quasi Gus, filming the interaction from nearby, shouting expletives as he tells Gus to get out of the way. He's just standing on the sidewalk. He responds with expletives, telling Kane to shut up when Sergeant Kane began pushing him, according to a complaint filed. The complaint says another bystander intervened as a second police officer, Nicholas Remick, continued the assault on Gus. I feel like being racist, you know what I mean? Because a, a, a young black man with a camera, you know, and, and, and got a white man with an attitude and a badge. And they essentially abused him in ways that was woefully unjustified. This was a person who was exercising his constitutional rights. The complaint alleges the two handcuffed Gus, kicked him in his ankle, forced him to the ground, and placed their knees on his back and ribs, also that they pushed his face into the ground. And when I tell you they was doing the most most dog and they was just they was just literally just dogging me according to the complaint gus was treated at the hospital for a head injury lower back pain wrist pain bruising to his ribs and acute stress disorder also that the encounter has affected his employment as a professional cowboy training horses riding in rodeos and giving lessons my wrist they hurt all the way from single to mile still aching every night i've been having nightmares bad dreams the complaint alleges Sergeant Kane had several complaints while serving as a canine handler and that this incident suggests Richmond PD failed to remediate Kane. This was a cop who was out of control. Earlier this month, Richmond police told ABC 7 News Chief Biza French had launched an investigation into the incident by an outside entity due to the Office of Professional Accountability being short-staffed. A spokesperson said since it's an open and active investigation, they are not releasing body camera footage at this time. And Richmond police say while the investigation is being conducted, Sergeant Kane will be temporarily reassigned to an administrative position without contact with the public. We reached out to the city attorney and city manager's office for comment and have not yet heard back. In the newsroom, Melanie Woodrow, ABC 7 News. 
I mean, it was hard to see, but it looked like dude was just standing there, like on the sidewalk. Yep. Not. I. I don't think the police are going to fare very well in the investigation here. Um, and uh, it's it's just sad. Like, oh yeah, he's not in contact with the public, but he's still getting paid. He's still getting you know all the benefits of being a cop. Just that the guy should go out and be a cop. Good for him. Um, it's uh, yeah. I. I, I <laughs> I hope this guy gets some, this cowboy gets some justice and he can, but uh, maybe he, maybe the, the Western store can give him a discount. So <clears throat> there are, <clears throat> we've been watching some stuff. Uh, some of the anti-Scientologists are going out and doing this thing that they call a first amendment audit where they're mm. like literally uh, harassing people. <clears throat> Just anybody that walks by basically like yelling at them and shit. And even like the, that's legal it's not smart like on hollywood sure. boulevard hollywood boulevard is the kind of place where somebody might punch you in the face oh and that's happened to a few of these people but what was happening here best i could see is the guy was standing on the sidewalk filming the cops and the one fucking dude rushed him yeah no and and that's just how it goes uh, and and they they let it you know we let it slide um as a as a culture as a society as a government institution but you know again hopefully the investigation you know, turns up some justice, but in general, you know, we, we ignore these, these little things, right? That it's good that they are getting captured now on, you know, whatever cell phone cameras. Like you remember, I, I think back to Rodney King a lot and that incident, right. And that how, um, how novel it was at the time. Um, cause I was still a young pup and I can remember this, right. Most of even my wife is probably too young to, to remember this, but you know, the, the grainy, camcorder video from like three blocks away video, you know, uh, footage that finally, finally put on record, right? Even though they end up getting acquitted, all that mess, but finally put on record in, in a visual and visceral way, how this goes down, right? And how this goes down all the time. Um, and now we're seeing it much you know, more and more because everyone now is a reporter. Everyone has a camera. We all have a camera in our pocket and we can all be reporters and we all have a, a platform. So the good news is I think that a lot of this is going to, more of this is going to be captured on film. Um, the bad news is that I, you know, I don't, the, the government and the powers that be are still out there protecting these guys um, and the gals. So we, we need to be, you know, just fight just as hard, no matter what kind of evidence there is. So <clears throat> if the guy was somehow interfering, you, it's, the, the the thing that just fucking stood out to me was the the way the cop was like the cop ran at him like he was getting, like he was a mm -hmm. linebacker and shit like it was like, yeah, like it was like dude yeah. just walk over right he like like the cop perceived this person as a threat right, right? and but i the, have, well, I the, have and the per but the cop was the threat like the correct yeah and i've seen that dude but dude i've seen that first i've seen that firsthand uh, the councilman is not the kind of guy who's going to engage you in some sort of physical confrontation the councilman loathes violence the councilman does not like violence and yet uh, you know even just sitting around at a protest literally sitting i have been you know uh, assaulted by police officers just pushed around shoved around knocked to the ground without ever raising a hand or a voice or anything any any sort of ill will towards these officers right they just perceive you as a threat because you are the other you are in you know, whatever, in whatever space or in their space and you look like the other, right? You were not, you were not the thing, you were, you were the thing that they're targeting. Um, and there's no, there's really no gray area, it seems like at all in these confrontations. And that's, that's the sad thing is that there doesn't seem to be any judgment, any rational thought involved. Granted, these decisions are happening quickly, but you kind of think that if you're empowering people to be police officers, they should be trained and be able to make competent decisions in a quick way under stress. Like that's the job. Like, I don't so, understand. Like, so if this, if they say like, there's something we don't know about where he was standing and how it impacted right. the situation. Right. You think that like a rational, a ra like the rational response would be like, Hey man, you, you mind standing over there? Yeah. Right. Um, they just assumed or for whatever, for whatever reason, they just assumed he was part of the, the madness and part of the, the right. other and the, the, the enemy. Um, and that, that was that. And they've made their decision. So um, he'll, he'll get his, he'll get his come up. He's got uh, Burris, Mr. Bur uh, uh, Mr. Burris on his case. That guy, like, I think he's like cloned. Like he's, <laughs> he is literally on every single one of these cases. If you, if you watch uh, the news or whatever, the news station, the 24 hour news stations, he's literally <laughs> the, the go-to civil rights, justice, uh, criminal justice uh, lawyer. If you're looking to sue a government agency. Right. He sort of like man. a, pre me too, gloria allred 
Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. He is, he is your guy. Now, and he's successful too. Like, don't get me wrong. It's not like he's, you know, people go to him because he's successful and he knows what he's doing. So good. So we're going to move on to get your shit together. And if you could imagine, it's about San Francisco. And uh, this is kind of a long clip. So we're just going to let it roll. Yeah, well, we can jump in. It's one of the most beautiful cities in America. Uh, Sometimes the beauty hides the beast. That is bureaucracy. Wow, the shot is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Building a better Bay Area means balancing those two. And ABC7 News reporter Leanne Melendez is here. You talking trash? You talking trash again, Leanne Melendez? (laughs) Only kindness and the truth. Oh, they're so happy they get to vamp a little bit. Listen, right. You talking last trash. Year, we learned through a report that it takes longer and it costs more to build homes in San Francisco than anywhere else in California. Homes aren't the only thing we're slow at. Now, sure, blame it on the pandemic, but does it take several years to cover the city with trash cans? Apparently so. For a major city, San Francisco has a fairly good number of trash cans, but we have a problem. Trash tends to find its way onto city streets, tarnishing mm-hmm. San Francisco's image even further. Like right here, they clean today, and two minutes later, somebody will trash it. It's been found that the more people litter, the more it becomes a habit. They're desensitized. Why can't we just have a nice can out in San Francisco, a nice wire basket like they have in some other cities? We tried that in our pilot program, and we saw that it didn't work. We're slobs. I don't know if it's thoughts. It's really beha- it's behavior issues. Yeah. The city then realized they needed some kind of human-resistant trash can without compromising aesthetics. But this is San Francisco, so it has to be different, right? They settled on a sleek new design. That was two years ago. Here's part of the reason for the delay. Rather than pick any design, Public Works decided to go the democratic route, asking residents to select a favorite from a few prototypes. Those special trash cans became yet another city pilot program, costing $550,000. That's a lot of money, $550,000. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of money. Uh, the garbage cans certainly, once they're into full mass production, aren't going to cost that much. We're hoping they'll cost about three thousand dollars. This is the model that could cost three thousand dollars, called Slim Silhouette. There's one along the Embarcadero, across from the Ferry Building. As seen in this photo, one was placed in the Tenderloin, but that's now gone. The sexy new cans are supposed to be graffiti resistant and hard to tamper with. And we've noticed that it's been tampered with. <laughs> it looked cute, pretty, that's it. We went from the spaceship to come back and get it. <laughs> Public Works says there will be some design changes and improvements made, like being able to fit a used pizza box. Right now, the opening isn't large enough. They also no. want to make sure that people can't get into the recycling portion so that this kind of rummaging doesn't happen. Why? I'm sounding sort of like yeah, my right? mom. Um, they're helping. What happened? What's wrong with the old ones? Okay, so the problem with the old cans, as we see, we get a lot of problems with people being able to go into the cans, rummage through them, and pull the garbage out. We want to have it so people just can't pull off the doors and smash the locks as easily as they do now. And finally, we want to have something that's a little bit aesthetically pleasing. Mind you, Public Works has yet to find a company that will mass produce them. So at the earliest, the cans will start to roll out by the summer of 2025. The city wants to purchase 3,000 trash cans. So do the math. That's $9 million. To clarify, ratepayer funding previously collected by Recology has already been set aside by Public Works to cover the costs of the cans. Board President Aaron Peskin, who is running against the incumbent mayor, has been critical of the costs and delays. I expressed these concerns years ago. Oh, he heard there was a camera somewhere. Oh, yeah, and he, he definitely was on this shit from the beginning. He's been advocating, I'm sure, for, you know, looking out into this from the very, very start. We wanted to have something special. Regardless of cost, we still don't have the cans. Right now, Public Works has a more immediate problem, like how to quickly replace the 15 Big Belly Smart Trash Cans, like this one, removed overnight from the North Beach neighborhood after the North Beach citizens, the local nonprofit, terminated their contract with the company that provided them. 
Big Belly. Big Belly has fallen down on the job. They're not servicing the cans well. Big They're not belly. taking care of them. They're not maintaining them. A dark mark left on the pavement is proof they were once here. The Office of Economic and Workforce Development expressed its disappointment with Big Belly, stating that such action would require a lot of coordination on the city side. <laughs> For now, it appears there will be no cans for the upcoming North Beach Festival. Attendees could carry their trash home, but of course there is always the street. Hmm, hopefully not. Now, tomorrow is the SF Fest at Italiana, <laughs> and the North Beach Street Fair is what? from June 15th <clears throat> through the 16th. Now, we reached out to Big Belly several days ago, and they never responded. And in the words of Larry Beal, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> So for the festival, what if they just went to like Home Depot and bought a bunch of fucking cheap trash cans and set them out with bags in them, sent people around to empty the bags and sort of let the chips fall where they may and just like give people an opportunity to throw shit away and accept that like some weird shit's going to happen to the cheap plastic trash cans. That's usually what happens at festivals anyway. I don't understand why they're reliant on city owned permanent trash cans to to do the work of a you know it usually that's not enough anyway those usually exist at street fest festivals anyway um and they still do what you're talking about so and have like you know a space for trash and recycling and compost even because it's san francisco um so yeah i don't understand how the festivals and these things are going to be impacted they probably plan for this already anyway they have porta potties because there's not enough ba like every, for example every building right every business has a bathroom right along this festival route but guaranteed it's not enough bathrooms to handle all the people needing to piss and shit during a festival so that's why they bring in porta potties right so it's sim similar thing like they, they bring in extra for what they need and they need more trash receptacles so that's not hurting them put um, the trash I, cans by the porta potties so everybody knows where the fucking trash cans and porta potties are right um and you know I, I sympathize with folks saying like it's too much money to spend for fancy trash cans i guarantee you even more utilitarian trash cans would cost just as much when you're talking about that kind of scale um and nine million dollars in the city and county budget of san francisco is not much when you're talking about a 15 billion dollar budget of some sort i think so you know long story short uh it, it, you're never going to find a trash can that folks are not going to be able to tamper with it if they want to get something out of it, right? Like it's just in, it's just industry, um, and I don't see why you don't like people just getting into the recycling and taking it to a recycling center. It's saving you and your staff the time and the the work of doing it. So fuck it, don't don't make it hard for them. <clears throat> I like also like I don't know like why not just fucking the trash cans that are already there i've used them in san francisco you know what happens i throw my trash in them and then i keep walking so i don't know yeah. why not just use the ones that are leave the ones that are there there repair them if you can and replace them with like just like i don't know just i don't i don't i don't even know like what the, what the fuck the problem like three thousand dollars it might be the right amount because maybe it's more durable but like it it's it's so yeah, like one of those things that like the rest of the country ends up making fun of San Francisco about, right? Yeah, like the wire mesh, like she said, the wire mesh, uh, the public works person, the wire mesh, you know, solution is utilitarian, cheapest, and it's really a behavioral thing, right? It's really, it really is. It's it's not about it's not about not being able to find a trash can or find one, you know, or or, or one that's going to fit a pizza box. It's getting people to respect and put the pizza box in the trash in the first place, you know, and it's not you know, any slide in any one group of folks, everyone's fucking litterers, right? All the party put people, the folks who are living on the streets who have no reason to follow our laws because we've shat upon them so much, but you know, and everyone, um, litters, everyone is responsible, is, is responsible for this and everyone needs to have some personal responsibility, but it's just life. It's just life in the city. As you know, as we talk about all the time, right? There's trash. You're in a city. There's going to be trash. Sorry, San Francisco. Right. There's going to be a Starbucks no one's cup on the ground. Right. There's going to be a Starbucks, period. Right. Like, oh, San Francisco, your kooky, quirky, you know, whatever attitude. And yet, how many Starbucks do you have in San Francisco? Like every fucking corner, right? At Hate Ashbury, there's a fucking Starbucks. So, you know, and a McDonald's. So let's get off our high horse and recognize that we're a city and just deal with it. Deal with the poop in front of the artisanal coffee shop. All right, we're going to move on to down ballot slash recall watch, yeah, yeah. where we've got, um, we only got three stories here. The first one is the Alameda uh, County DA, Pamela Price, uh, responds after the recall election date was set at the date it should be on the date of the other election. This there is, uh, this is good for her, but it's also just, um, like a good, good governance and 
prudent because now all you're doing is adding yeah. a line to an existing ballot. So there you let's, go. See, let's see what let's see what the news has to say, and let's see if they uh, have any uh, people uh, who are complaining about this because that's my favorite part is the people complaining so. about them doing the obvious thing. Probably. You will see them fundraising, organizing, doing what we have to do to protect the win. And my part is to do my job. Surrounded by her supporters, Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price says she's gearing up for another campaign, dubbed Protect the Win, now that a date has been set for her recall election. We're going to prosecute people, as we have been, who do harm to others in our community. Tuesday night, the Alameda County Board of Supervisors voted to combine the recall election with November's general election. Price praises supervisors for not holding a special election, which would have cost taxpayers upwards of $20 million. This is a victory for the people of Alameda County. This is a win for democracy. The group Safe or Save Alameda County for Everyone is leading the recall campaign. They accuse DA Price of being soft on crime. Even East Bay Congressman Eric Swalwell last week tweeting about an attack on a postal carrier. He writes, soft on crime Alameda County prosecutors oh, have given the bad man, that's disappointing. Like to hurt people. We need rule of law. Congressman Smallwell has made no effort whatsoever Swalwell. to the Alameda County District Attorney's Office to find out what we are doing in terms of prosecuting people and holding people accountable. D.A. Price right. points out attacking a postal carrier is a federal crime and wouldn't be prosecuted by her office. Oh, shit. <laughs> She's like, listen. Listen, I know the law, Mr. Swallowell. Also spoke of a state investigation into the PAC funding the recall and possible litigation due to concerns over the signature gathering by the recall team. We are evaluating all of our options, and I can't really speak publicly about what the lawyers will do. Meanwhile, SAFE says it's just pleased that a date has finally been set for the recall election and that they will be monitoring how Price's campaign proceeds. There are many, many occasions she's using, uh, you know, her, uh, using the office and resources uh, doing her campaign. So, you know, we just want to making sure that, you know, she should not be doing this. Sorry. ABC 7 News. Damn, yeah. that was that was that was great when she's like, oh, that's a federal crime. Uh, we wouldn't be prosecuting this. Um. Oh, that was so funny. Um, and yeah, that's disappointing from Representative Swalwell. I, I think more highly of you than that in general. And I can't believe you're you know, buying into this lowest common denominator bullshit. Is it to win votes? I, I don't know. You seem pretty secure in your seat. So. I don't understand what what you get from jumping on this fucking particular bandwagon, but good for her. Just, just she's like, my job here is to do my job. You all go out there and win this election and fight this recall. I'm going to be busy doing my job and doing the things that all you folks elected me to do. You go out there and protect my win, right? Like that's great. That's a great message. It's great look, and I think it will be successful because I, I'm. I think people are getting a little tired of this kind of bullshit. Um, I think people are just see- inclined. <clears throat> people are just going to be inclined to vote no, just because they're mm-hmm. like, "Who? Who's the DA again? Who's the Alameda County DA? I don't even know who that is." Right, and there, there are also just so many people. I think they underestimate how many people are not interested in recalls and, and know how wasteful they are and, and see how, and how tired they are of them. Um, the recall of Chesa Boudin, notwithstanding, there was, I think there were some very specific circumstances at play there, but regardless I, I i think people know especially from the gavin newsom attempted recall they kind of understand that it's a waste of energy and resources and time and that we have things called elections where you can run people against people if you don't like their policies um and recall really should be used for you know really egregious like like if i don't know the president is convicted of a felony right while they're in office that right. might well, be a we reason can't recall to recall the president them. but i know what you're saying right like, you know what i'm saying right or, or let's say let's say the da actually committed a crime right like she her office committed an actual crime right yeah that might be a reason for recalling her but just doing her job the way she saw fit and that she sees fit and that the voters empowered her to do that's not a recallable offense that's just petty and sore losers basically yeah, well, we'll see what happens. It'll be one of the things we keep an eye on on this uh, yeah. coming November election night. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be like not a fun night around here. There's gonna, there's a lot of shit going on, and there's uh, some, there is the big, some the big shit. networks like like issuing uh, takedowns of uh, live streams during that. So we're gonna have to be extra careful and that kind of thing. 
Yeah, we'll also have to watch for uh, Peter Thiel land when that that's going to be on the ballot in November as well. So, all right. So up next, we got the uh, former Oakland Police Chief Armstrong, uh, who was uh, removed uh, for reasons that are still largely unknown, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> is uh, running for Oakland City Council while he's uh, suing the the city for wrongful termination. If you can't beat him, join him, right? Hey everybody, this is a live show. Sometimes the video doesn't just pl- doesn't play right away. Let's see if a uh, r- page refresh helps. Let's see. Refresh. Refresh. Former Oakland go. Police Chief Laron Armstrong is making some new political moves. Fired a little over a year ago by Mayor Shang Tao, the former police chief now has his eyes set on City Hall, but now he wants to join them. ABC7 News reporter Ansar Hassan was there today as Armstrong launched his campaign for office. Former Oakland Police Chief Laron Armstrong filed paperwork Wednesday morning in a bid for Oakland City Council. I could serve beyond, you know, law enforcement, beyond the police department, that I could continue to give back to my community that's given so much to me. Armstrong lives in District 7, but is running for the at-large seat, which represents the entire city. Armstrong joins the race with eight other candidates. He says his top priorities are public safety, homelessness, and improving Oakland's image. Those images that are out there about the city doesn't fairly represent what Oakland is about. And so really trying to beautify this city so that the image of it can be what I see which is a beautiful city uh, that is not like any other city in the state. The chief was fired by Mayor Sheng Tao last February after an investigation found he mishandled two cases involving his officers. An independent arbitrator later cleared him of any wrongdoing. But he has filed a wrongful termination lawsuit, which he says won't impact this race. He may not have prior legislative experience, but points out that he led the largest department in the city with the largest budget. So I understand how to balance budgets and how to manage that. I balanced the uh, the OPD budget for the first time in 40 years, the first chief to do that. The Oakland chapter of the NAACP is backing Armstrong. Robert Harris says all of Oakland's problems are directly or indirectly tied to public safety, which gives Armstrong an edge. Businesses are leaving because of public safety. People are afraid to go out on the streets because of public safety. But others are concerned that with Armstrong on city council, OPD could get even more money in the future. We're operating under uh, in a city that you know has has you know is 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 spending hundreds of millions of dollars of unchecked money on law enforcement, right? And and under the chief's tenure, this this amount skyrocketed. Armstrong wouldn't comment on the recall campaign against Mayor Tao, but adds, if the mayor's seat becomes open, nothing is off the table. In Oakland, Ansar Hassan, ABC Seven News. That'd be great. The guy she fires ends up taking her spot. Yeah, right. But Irony. Again, recalls. I, I, I don't think they're that. That's that's a no, that's a non-starter. Recalling the Oakland mayor at this point, I think. I forget where they're at with it. Honestly, they there are folks. There were folks gathering signatures for it, um, but I don't know what they're where they stand. I think they got held up in some way because they. I don't know. Their signatures weren't valid. Probably. Uh, anyway, the, the, this should be fun. It's always uh, always interesting to, when this happens. This has happened before in in other cases. Um, shit, even in my case. Um, so. Uh, It'll be fun to watch. I don't, I don't know who he's running against. It's an, it's an at large spot, so Oakland's yeah. kind of strange with their elections. So they have districts, but they also have at large spots. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't know enough about it, but it, <clears throat> I, I the news maybe could have done a better job of explaining that because it would have only taken thirty seconds to be like there are you know X number of district spots and X number of at large spots, but whatever. Right. Whatever. And this is who gets to vote. So it's it's basically the whole city will get to vote on him. So and it's ranked choice. So. We shall see. He seemed like a pretty popular chief at the time. I don't know who else is running for these seats or how many are open, but I would imagine he's got a pretty decent shot. It seems like he's had a lot of you know community support since he was fired, and he's got a great narrative to tell, great story to tell. So, hey, good luck. Yeah, good luck to all the candidates, I suppose, good until luck. we good learn more candidates. about them. <laughs> yes. I mean, just running for office is uh, thankless and uh, can be torturous. Uh, both to your mental and physical well-being um, and your family. So, uh, yeah, good on you if you're willing to take the plunge, especially nowadays when, you know, even some of our more moderate and conservative council members are getting bomb threats at their house, right? Um, uh, or bombs placed outside their house even uh, and death threats. Um, you know, it's it's not in school board members are getting death threats and violent, threats of violence. That's just not cool. So it's, 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 it's very difficult to recruit anyone to, to run for office these days. So good for you if you if you try. Uh, speaking of bomb threats, the uh, <clears throat> California Republican uh, convention happened uh, this week. 
and it and, was a bomb it was a bomb no there wasn't a bomb there i'm just like i'm just oh. trying to trying to do a trying to do there was no bomb there but christy oh, okay. Nome was there oh then she bombed is what i'm saying like yeah was, sure right. um this is in berlin game which should be a surprise to no one and we'll see how the local news covers this Maybe Berlin. The state Republican Party convention is under week underway this weekend in the Bay Area. Lineup of Trump supporters headline. Look at the diverse room of the convention that's being held in Burlingame. South Dakota Governor Christy Nome was one of the keynote speakers today. Dahlin has more on the convention. Former President Donald Trump may not win out the deep blue state of California come November, but he has a lot of supporters at the California GOP convention held in Burlingame, including Ashley Prong Styles. Less government, more people have confidence in the people. Some say it's a Trump heavy convention and that the keynote speakers are Trump allies like South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem. I'm very good friends with him. I talk to him all the time. In her Saturday afternoon speech, the governor highlighted her state's success and how her policies align with Trump. We took a very different pathway through COVID than what your governor did. South Dakota was the only state in the country that never once closed a single business. We never once mandated masks or vaccines. We have broken the national historic unemployment record for the lowest unemployment at 1.7% because everybody in South Dakota works. She took jabs at California Governor Gavin Newsom, President Joe Biden, and even former President Barack Obama. That guy could talk, too. If there ever was anybody who could talk smoothly and lie at the same time, it was President Obama. Nome is set to be a possible running mate for Trump. She's a tough gal. She makes the tough decisions, and that's what we need. I think she would make a great running mate with him. Um, she has the values and the actions that she took in her state. One prominent Republican who was a no-show at the convention was Senate to candidate Steve Garvey. Some political experts say he's trying to distance himself from Trump to win over independent voters. Why isn't he here? Steve Harvey, where are it's you? It's Steve Garvey. <laughs> the park. Steve Harvey is on TBS right now. The people that are doing the batting for you, buddy, get yourself in. Some moderate Republicans say nice and the strategy for the party leadership. It's a balancing act. Uh, there are many very, very strong Trump supporters. And then there are people who are skeptical. They have to accommodate all sides. And it's really like walking on a tightrope. Ashley is a Garvey supporter and a Trump supporter. The L.A. resident who grew up in the Bay Area says California is going in the wrong direction. She wants to see changes in policies that will reduce crime and improve public schools. There's something wrong here. It's not it's not family friendly. It's not business friendly. And she believes her party can fix those problems. Of course, they've got a, a big road ahead to give you an idea of how rarely California elects Republicans to statewide offices. The last one to serve as a U.S. senator from California was Pete Wilson. Uh, he was elected to two terms starting in 1991. Later on, he resigned to become the state's governor. And our only Republican governor in this entire century, of course, was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, there, well, there we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> the, the California GOP, one of the most irrelevant political parties on earth. Uh, but they think they're so cool. They got Christy Nome to come speak. That's kind of cool. That's interesting. Um, they couldn't find a, a a Californian Republican to be the keynote, <laughs> or they didn't think of that. Like I, honestly, they probably thought they probably thought of her first. There aren't a lot of, like they said, there really aren't a lot of statewide Republicans who have that kind of swag. Um, and you know, Steve Garvey, I guess, is one of them now, but not really like in sort of any long term sense. They don't have the California GOP doesn't have like champions and and uh, or even just prominent you know, figures like a Gavin Newsom or a Kamala Harris um, on the Democratic side, right? They don't have rock stars. They've got the also rans who, you know, somehow uh, wiggle their way into races um, that they can't win, but, you know, make a little name for themselves like Mr. Garvey, but Mr. Garvey is also a baseball player too. So he's got a reputation he wants to protect. I'm sure be, that goes beyond elections. He wants to make sure that his signature and autograph is still a valuable commodity uh, on the circuit in the future. So he's doing his best to protect his brand too. So good for him. Um, he's not going to win. Uh, so it's probably best that he he do that anyway. He's kind of like the sacrificial lamb in a way. Um, but hey, he, he can sign more caps that way. So uh, that's our 
<clears throat> main docket for this week, but we have and another thing, and usually it's an animal story, but this time we have a bit of good news. Um, <clears throat> this is actually super good news because I got to tell you, one of one of my favorite beers uh, disappeared. Anchor Anchor Steam California Lager was a good fucking hot day beer, man. Yeah, it's a real good a hot one. day beer. <clears throat> and it looks like the Chobani guy is uh gonna go ahead and purchase Anchor. <clears throat> And a uh, related note from our other shows, that guy uh, went up against Alex Jones when Alex Jones <laughs> accused him of being a fucking child trafficker or some weird right? shit. Right? So, so there you go. We like this guy already. Here's the here's the local news hit. Beer. Survival of one of San Francisco's most beloved brands and institutions. Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Cook. Ten months after Anchor Brewing announced it was closing its doors, there are new signs of life. The billionaire owner of Chobani plans to buy the nation's oldest craft brewery. Anchor, as you know, has been a staple through its 127-year history, but could not survive a triple whammy of inflation, lingering effects of the pandemic, and a highly competitive craft beer market. Last July, beer lovers said goodbye to the brewery, forming long lines out the door on its last day. Now, there are still a lot of questions left about this acquisition, including the future of former workers and how Anchor Brewing will look once it's finally back open. Our Kevin Coe checked in with former workers and neighbors who are eager to celebrate the comeback. I think the neighborhood really loves the spot, was bummed when they uh, heard it was closing, and great to see it coming back. I used to go to Anchor quite frequently, great with the dog, bring kids in the stroller, things like that. Anchor Brewing Company was a family affair with fans from across the pond. I'm visiting from London, uh, but we used, to, we used to hit that spot quite a bit. America's first craft brewery is on its way back after it was acquired by Shepherd Futures, the parent company of the Chobani yogurt brand. CEO and founder Hamdi Ulukaya released a video on social media this morning, speaking of the purchase. I think the best time of San Francisco is yet to come. It comes after a heartbreaking end for the brewery last July, when Sapporo chose to shut the brewery down. It left employees like Patrick Costello out of work. At the end of the day, we just want to go back home to our jobs that we know and love. I do wonder if why working here is so important uh, to you and everyone else. It feels a lot bigger than what you are. It's the godfather of craft beer, so we wouldn't know craft beer today if it wasn't for Anchor. The union, representing former production workers at Anchor Brewing, released this statement, asking to meet with Ulukaya as soon as possible to discuss bringing Anchor workers back. I'm optimistic and hopeful about this new owner. I do appreciate that somebody came in and wants to keep with what the brand was and understand that the workers are kind of at the front of it. Anchor's neighbors, like Kimmy, are optimistic too. It's just like a huge life force for this neighborhood, um, but it's great to hear that they're coming back. The life force is a good way of putting it. There'll definitely be more life force with the coming back. Cheers to Giovanni, I guess. Yeah, th thanks for saving Anchor. So while former workers are staying optimistic and many locals are obviously excited, it's still unclear when exactly Anchor Brewing Company will open its doors once again. It'll be a while. Yeah, they got to get things sorted with uh, you know, infrastructure, all that, you know, upgrades, contracts, distribution rights. Oh, workers. There's so many things that go into this. This, But um, you know what? They're, if anyone's prepared, it's the Chobani yogurt industry, right? They've, they've got that pretty much down. So, Not for nothing, just because of the legacy reputation. I think a lot of the a lot of distributors and um, other industry players would be uh, willing to grease the wheels in whatever way they can because it looks 100%. good for them. And because, like, imagine being like if you're the first liquor store to get the Anchor Steam back, like in right. San Jose, you're right. doing real good, right? <laughs> like, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, no, that the 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 streams will flow again, right? They, they've got a brand. It's 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 a really good investment. This guy's very smart and very savvy. Um, so it's a very good investment and good for San Francisco, good for beer, beer lovers. That's fa That's fabulous. And good for those workers. So hope good that we can have another thing that's more of a happy human interest story uh, as opposed to, you know, the other end of this, the other end of the docket with meat all over the freeway. So, yeah, we started with food sort of and ended with food uh, sort of. I, sort I of. do want to say that, like, 
<clears throat> I'm glad it was this brand just because I think that he's going to be inclined just based on what I know about him to like want to bring back the union employees and want to bring back the brand as part of that neighborhood because that's what, even though that's not, you know, their, mo their money doesn't come from that tap room. Right. But it's like a good marketing thing. And it sure. people, people who like that beer will come if they visit San Francisco, they'll seek it out. And so I think he'll bring it back. And I think that, you know, he's younger than a lot of CEOs. He doesn't seem, he seems like he's maybe 10 years older than I am. He, he may be older than that and just look good, but I feel like there, he may be inclined to, um, maybe inclined to make that like an entertainment spot as well. Bring more, bring more bands, more local artists and stuff into just cause that's sort of been his, just my impression of him. I could be totally wrong. He could go in and bust the union and fuck everything up because that's what his shareholders want. But that mm -hmm. would be the problem with that is that's not only like shitty, but I think in this case it'd be bad business because the neighborhood would be like, Oh great. We're not coming. Yeah. Anyone else can do that. Right. So this, this is an investment and it's good to see. Um, and it's not, hopefully it's not just plain yogurt. Hope it's that like fruit on the bottom, and it, it's, it's to the top. by no means going to be a cash cow for that company. I think it's more no. about of a reputation thing. Yeah, well, I mean the the uh, I think the business itself could be prop absolutely be profitable for them. Um, the tap room is like a marketing space, really, more than anything else, right? So if that breaks even, I think they're fine. And you're yeah, allowed yeah, you yeah, network right, with. If is... They don't just have anchor there. You network with other breweries. You yeah. That kind oh, of dude, and, and you you part and partner up with your own brand too, right? Like I'm certain I'm going to be seeing, you know, it's on my Safeway app or whatever, some sort of product deal with, you know, you buy three Chobani's and get a six pack of Anchor for free or something or for five bucks. So that yeah, they'll figure it out. They'll make yeah. it work, and that's good. Uh, but I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if I'd be surprised if we we start seeing Anchor even by next summer. I think it's going to oh, it's a lot easier. Yeah. It's a it, it's a lot quicker to shut something down than it is to bring it back. Yeah, very much so. And they and there's like there's a lot of things they have to work out um to begin with. So but yeah, it's great news. Well, great. You want to read the show out? Oh, oh, well, might as well. I can hear the the bad baby washing her hands and brushing her teeth in the other room. So it's time, as always, children, to put the baby to bed and to move on to public comment. So stick around for producer Dave in the red light portion of the show as he explores the dangerous world of public comment and public meetings. Uh, it's really weird out there, folks. Um, as always, we do this show 7.30 p.m. every Tuesday night, except when we don't, uh, as has been the case recently, 7 p.m. on Pacific time, by the way. Um, so we encourage you to show up for the live show. Keep downloading the podcast. Keep us the ninth best local news podcast in California, according to some dude. Please be sure to get back to wear a mask pants are optional we're going to leave you some audible smoke and we hope you have a great week peace out <laughs>
Sexy girl be jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck But I'll probably do a slap We do what we want What we wanna do And what we want is to jam So I'll sit back and enjoy the band Dance with the band and enjoy the band We do what we want What we wanna do And what we want is to jam So I'll sit back and enjoy the band Thank you, Bob. We do. Yes, I gotta say. 